Hello, welcome everyone to the Mark Twain Library segment tonight on Alaska. We have people coming in from all over. So welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. We can't wait to get started in just a minute. We're gonna allow people to just trickle in. And as they do, we just wanna remind you that we're chatting about Alaska tonight. It is the Mark Twain Library's travel dreaming series called Alaska, close to home, but a world away. So we're going to chat in and uh, certainly get started in just a minute. As people are coming in, let me review a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first and foremost, we're recording tonight, which is fantastic. If you need to step away, or if you wanna share this with friends and loved ones later, you can certainly always find our programs on the Mark Twain Library's YouTube channel. And that is for many of the programs that's run through the library. Secondly, of course, we invite you to have a conversation with us. Tell us what you're interested in, ask us questions along the way, and we will do our very best to answer those questions or find great answers for you in the future. Um, but we're gonna use the chat feature as well as the question and answer box. So if everybody can locate that chat feature at the very bottom of your screen, maybe we'll just ask a couple of questions while we have people here. Has anyone on the call ever been to Alaska or does anyone have plans, ticket in hand, already going? Do we have just thinking about it in a couple of years from now? Oh, lots of people. We have lots of people thinking, lots of people pondering. Oh, some experts. So I'll tell our experts here, they gotta be on their toes tonight with all sorts of folks with great questions and people who wanna go back for a next time. So I know and can see that everyone has found the chat feature and we'll certainly welcome you to use that throughout uh, tonight's conversation. Certainly, I just wanna go into a little bit of hello at the Mark Twain Library, a little bit about me as well. My name is Angela Kayas and I am a member of the Adult Programming Committee uh, and my second hat happens to be a local business here in Reading that focuses on travel, uh, truly focuses on big, small, but custom personalized travel to wonderful destinations like Alaska. And it is that privilege of working in this industry for more than 20 years, which is hard to believe because I'm so young, um, but working in this industry for so long that I've had the pleasure to meet some of the very best. And I am thrilled today to be partnering with Lindblad Expeditions, who bring to us not only a wealth of information and knowledge about this area, but they have been traveling to Alaska for more than 35 years. They have insider's knowledge like you wouldn't believe. And we are so fortunate today here to have two individuals with us, uh, both Lisa Bain, as well as Craig Moylan. And before they introduce themselves, I just want to tell you a little bit about where we're going today. So let's get centered. We're going to Alaska. It's not part of the contiguous 48. It is often called the last frontier. I believe it's gonna be one of the more wild places that you can visit so close to home. And just to give you a sense, in 2019, they had 2.6 million visitors. To give you a sense, if you put everybody in the state of Connecticut, that's 3.5 million people. 2.6 million people visited this beautiful, beautiful destination. It is huge. It is as large as Texas, California, and Montana combined. It has incredible rugged coasts, over 100,000 glaciers, and a 122-mile-long Bering Glacier, which I'm fairly sure everyone on this call may know about if you've been or are planning to travel. And again, some people know it has the only temperate rainforest in the United States as well. So I just want to mention that, gosh, getting there, people can often ask me, how do you get there? Well, there's a couple of ways to do that. Certainly there are direct flights, anywhere from seven to nine hours of travel will get you out there um, from a New York base. And if we have people coming from elsewhere in the country, we certainly know that there are different ways to get there with fabulous carriers. There's also driving. And many times people go as well by ship and vessel. We were just chatting and I'm gonna to have to share some random information with you tonight. But 2021, you might be thinking, who's gonna travel there? Well, if you've ever wondered what wild Alaska is like, this is the year to know. Last year, nobody went. Truly, the numbers were incredibly small. And so these amazing landscapes, natural wildlife, natural fauna, 
has been existing now without tourists for quite a number of months. And people do have an opportunity to travel if and when they're ready. For some people that's 2021, for some people that's later. Tonight, we are just going to wow you with the opportunity that's available. But I do wanna mention that there are one or two US-based, American-made, vessels and companies that are able to travel there in 2021. And Lindblad Expedition happens to be one of these amazing groups that's not only American made ships, but also flagged, crewed, and based in the United States. And that gives them a huge leg up, not only to love the country that they are founded in and certainly visit, but also a deep appreciation and ability to go to Alaska like no other. And it is with that that I get off my little hobby horse here and introduce some of the most interesting friends and friends with great knowledge that I have in this world. So over to you, Lisa Bain, tell us more about what we're doing tonight. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Angela. It's always such a joy for us to be invited. I know we helped to kick off this um, program with the Mark Twain Library with Jen Martin when we talked about Antarctica. So we're really excited to be back to talk about Alaska and I'm playing a really small part in this this evening because I am joined by Craig Moylan. And Craig is a really amazing individual. He grew up in Chicago. Um, so the great outdoors probably weren't the top thing on his list when he was a kid, when he was growing up. But his family really did implant that appreciation of, of the natural world by going out and, and visiting some of the national parks in North America. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that really does make a huge difference when you're a child, right? And then he really did kick that into overdrive when he to, made a very kind of last minute off the cuff decision to take a seasonal job up in Alaska way back in 2005. Um, I think it was his first year out of college. You might correct me on that, but I think it was. Uh, he went up to Alaska to spend a summer in Denali National Park. Um, and I think it changed his entire life. I mean, Craig has been up there. He spent nine years in Southeast Alaska working um, in tourism. He explored the, the amazing Tongass National Forest um, and all of those amazing islands and inlets, many of which we visit now. Uh, in 2014, he left Alaska and he was actually working for one of those really big ships. I'm not even gonna mention who they are um, in international <laughs> operations. But I think his love of wildness and getting out there really was calling to him. And that's when he joined us at Limblad Expeditions um, in Seattle in early 2018. So, uh, you know, he really has got such a thirst for exploration. If we had a whole night, he could tell you about his amazing wedding, which was on the Columbia and Snake River. So he's got a few favorite places. But Craig is Director of Expedition Development. Uh, for North and Central America for us at Limblad Expedition. So that means he's responsible for setting our itinerary, so itinerary development and the operations of our US flagships that visit these remarkable areas. And he's been really lucky because we built two brand new ships in the last two years to visit this remarkable place. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Craig and he's gonna share his stories from when he first went up and spent that first year in Alaska to what it's like to travel there now. Thanks, Craig. Great, well, thanks so much, Lisa. I, I really appreciate the introduction and Angela as well. Um, it's just fantastic to be here. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's been a fun process to put this together um, and, and be able to go back through some of my photos. So I'll keep the presentation casual today as we go through just some of my photos and some of the things that, that spark my memories and I think the best way to talk about Alaska for me is, is to talk about how it trans, uh, transformed my life and the role that it's played in the last 15 years. Um, I think that that will, will give you the sense of the impact that Alaska can have. And so it all started, uh, you know, as Lisa mentioned, all the way back in 2005, just after college. Um, I, you know, I took a, a real chance and decided to go do a seasonal job after, uh, after college, had absolutely nothing to do with my degree in economics decided let's go and, and just see some something different. So I arrived in, in Denali National Park about mid-June. And I remember showing up and, and again, I was raised in the suburbs of Chicago. So I, I really, I had, had had an ability to get out and see some wilderness, but hadn't really seen wilderness, wilderness, seen, seen these massive mountains, seen the you know, incredible amount of wildlife and, and, and just these wide open spaces. 
And, you know, of course you go to Denali and there's, there's one thing you're after usually, and it's, it's, it's seeing, seeing this, uh, it's seeing the great one. It's, it's seeing Denali, um, Denali mountain and, and really getting a chance to, uh, feel, you know, feel small. I mean, it's, 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 you realize you're in the midst of this, this massive national park and, 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 and you're in the middle of, of such a remote area and, and, and you're just in an area you feel like no one has ever been. And so I have to tell, you know, I, I had someone ask me once, they said, what was the, the moment that you connected with, with wildlife, with wilderness, you know, in your entire life, what was that one moment? And I immediately thought of my first time into the Denali National Park. I had gone in, again, pretty fresh out of, out of Chicago, had gone in on this park, rode the park bus in to explore the park. It's the only way you can get into the park uh, past the first few miles. Um, got into the park and I decided to get off the bus. So you can do that. You can actually get off the bus and do a little walking from uh, for a little while and then get back on the bus. And I'll never forget as this bus, you know, I, I get off the bus, this bus pulls away and it was absolutely nothing but silence. It was in the middle of, of this giant area, absolutely nothing, nothing but silence around me and just the beauty of the mountain. And of course, it was just moments later that I remembered that we had seen 11 bears on the way into the, uh, into the park. And I thought to myself, hey, here's a guy from Chicago who's out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> with a bunch of bears. But it was really an eye-opening moment. It, it made me really think to myself, um, you know, that there was a, there was a lot more to, to explore throughout Alaska. And, and that'll be a theme as we talk through the, through the uh, afternoon or through the evening. So, you know, I had a lot of those moments, uh, a lot of those moments where I, I, I found myself as someone um, exploring new things and really gaining an appreciation for, for the wildlife, for the land and everything else. And so this photo actually made me think of, of that as well. And it's, it's not often someone presents a photo of the backside of a moose uh, to you, but in this situation, you know, I went out on a, out on a hike and I was, I was out with a friend and we were hiking along and it was my first time coming across a full grown moose. Uh, this is a female moose here in, the, in this example. And she was coming right down the path and she had a, a, a cow, a, she was a cow um, with a cub with her, uh, excuse me, a calf with her. And, you know, here, here she is and we came face to face and it was my first time having that experience and realizing there was so much wildlife out there um, just all around. So one of those things that certainly makes me, makes me feel like uh, I was very, very fortunate to see this. So I worked for my summer in Alaska up in Denali National Park, got a chance to really explore up there, see a lot of wildlife um, and, and, and meet a lot of great people. I then had an opportunity to move down to Southeast Alaska and I moved on to uh, Skagway, Alaska. Now this is, an Im is not an image of Skagway, this is actually Juneau here. But I always think this is this is important to mention because, you know, when I would be down there and I would be out on these little excursions uh, where I'd go out to the middle of nowhere with some friends, we'd take a boat out to go explore. Every once in a while, I would wake up and I would see these tiny little boats out there, and I, and I thought to myself, you know, I, I kind of placed it in the back of my memory at the time uh, as I thought about these little boats out there. Of course, you saw the giant cruise ships that you see in these photos here, and and frankly, those are those are looking at those closer. Those are kind of smaller cruise ships uh, by, by this day and age. And if you look really closely, you'll see there's one tiny ship down there in between the two cruise ships. And that's actually one of ours, that's one of the Lindblad ships. So I didn't know it at the time, 10 years, it would take me almost 10 years to realize it, but I was actually looking at Lindblad ships uh, that were sailing through these small little areas that were out in these tiny little coves that I was out in my friend's you know, private boats out exploring. So I always think this image is, is one that um, brings me back to that. So I'm working in Skagway. Uh, I'm down there. I'm enjoying the uh, the history of Skagway, the gold rush, um, learning a lot about uh, the National Park uh, Service that's that's there in Skagway, and learning about this incredible journey that people went through during the gold rush, and you know, hauling 2,000 pounds of goods through uh, the Yukon up to the Yukon Territory, and floating on the on, on the Yukon River, and, and this this amazing trek to Dawson. And it's this. You know, Skagway is a spectacular little valley. It's, it's only has 800 year round residents. And I'm in this valley and, and it, I'm, I'm, in, I'm enjoying it and I'm, and I'm seeing something different. I'm back by the water. And one day I got a, a great opportunity to go in a helicopter out of Skagway. 
And I'll never forget this. This is another moment of really feeling like you understand the grandeur of Alaska. So I, I get on this helicopter and this helicopter lifts up and it goes up a couple thousand feet and gets up above these, these, this valley. And it's as soon as we get above this valley that I realize that for in every direction, as far as the eye can see is nothing but mountains and glaciers. There's no other towns, there's nothing else. It's just mountains and glaciers. And I have a photo from that day. This is, boy, I was young back then. But this is standing up on top of a pinnacle. We landed the helicopter, we stood up there. And I remember that, 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 that moment very, very vividly as I was looking around. <clears throat> and again, that's all you see. That's the Fairweather Range out in the distance. Um, some just absolutely spectacular moments. And, and that's when you realize that you're just surrounded by pure wilderness, by areas that, that people have never traveled to in their lives. So it really hammered home to me just how incredible Alaska was. It also reiterated to me, you know, and this is as I began to work with Limblad and, and really started to learn this over the years, it reiterated, reiterated to me how important it is to, to see things from different perspectives. So, here, you know, by here it's on a helicopter, uh, getting a, an overview. Um, on our trips, we, we go out in these zodiacs and, and you get an eye level and you start to really explore some of the areas in zodiacs and, and get a chance to spend some time. This is a, a great expedition leader of ours, uh, John Mitchell, um, out showing people you know, exactly what, what are you getting in, looking at the details, the coastline, seeing some of the, the animals. You also realize again how small you are. Uh, this looks like it's in Misty Fjord here and it's you know, these giant waterfalls coming off. If you look closely, you, you may even see there's a, a second zodiac there underneath the waterfall. And there, again, you just start to get this feeling that you're, um, you're, you're part of something bigger up in Alaska. Of course, there's always the fortunate uh, times where you can get, get out with some wildlife there. And then also, of course, by plane as well. Also, Constantly we're taking to the, to the water uh, in kayaks. I think a kayak to me is personally one of the best ways you can possibly see Alaska. Uh, I think to get down on the water and really be surrounded by the kelp and the sea otters and, and of course seeing a bear from the distance like this is, is something that's really special. And then also of course pouts and a paddle boards. Best way though without a doubt is to get on the ground and to, to go out and really explore. And this is, these here, these photos are taken in a place called Lake Eva, um, it's east of Sitka. And, you know, when, when, you, when you get out on the ground and you start to walk around on these trails, they're not necessarily trails in a lot of these places, you're bushwhacking. And you, you truthfully feel like you're the only person that's ever been there. You start to really look in and see the ferns. Uh, you get a chance to see, again, some of the mountains. Um, get out and explore some of the some of the land and start to look for some of the small things. Um, you know, learning about whether that's learning about the beavers in the area and just how important the beavers are to, to the ecosystems. Uh, small dragonflies, um, looking at some of the starfish in the area. Some of these things you really start to notice all the little details uh, of an area when you start to, to take your time, slowly get down and, 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 and you know, look at fungi, berries. And then of course the things that I feel like we're all sort of after when we're up in Alaska and, and there is by no means a shortage of them. You start to see things like this. You start to see bear prints. You start to see some other things that you start start realizing there's bigger things around you. Um, here's a couple of photos that I took. Um, uh, this is in a place outside of Juneau, a really small area out, outside of Juneau. And you know these, these big grizzly bears came down and they were this time, this was in um, late July, and there's a sockeye run going up this. It's called Sweetheart Creek is the name of the place. And there's a, uh, there's a sockeye run that was going up here. There were bears everywhere. I mean, it was, it was spectacular. I was actually, at this time, I was here with a friend uh, of mine, and we were uh, cast netting there. And, and you know, we were in there with the bears. I mean, the bears are, are all around you. This bear in particular actually... Uh, we had been on that point, uh, oh, probably 10 minutes prior, uh, and this bear came in and, and it was his turn to fish and we backed up and, and he took his time and he, he fished as he wanted to. Um, but you, again, you kind of start to realize that you're, you're no longer in your world, you're in their world. Uh, the, the number of bears in the area is, is just spectacular and hardly a trip goes by, if any, where we don't get a chance to see bears. Um, there's just so many throughout the area. You can also see on that right side, that's my size 12 boot, uh, extra tough boot. 
uh, standing next to a next to a bear's paw a paw print, so you get a chance to see how big uh, they are. This photo here is uh, in Neats Bay, so this is outside of um, Ketchikan, Alaska, which is where I lived for nine years. Um, and this is Neats Bay. This is a little a little black bear cub that's teaching his uh, uh, teaching his his sow to or excuse me his cub to um, catch salmon and, and eat salmon. So. Uh, they spent all day just in this creek, um, nonstop, just feasting on these on these salmon. This photo here was taken from the bow of one of our ships, and it was actually taken by Lisa. Uh, it was taken, uh, I believe, it was Glacier Bay is where she was, um, seeing the bears there. And you know that's where you know, we talk about some spectacular areas, and I'll get into Glacier Bay in a moment. But you have great opportunities to, you know, and, and no trip's going to be the same. Um, you know, anytime you go to Alaska, it's going to be going to be different. But you have really great opportunities to see wildlife, and we we try to put people in the best position to do that. Uh, it takes time, though, you know. So, I, I, if I have one recommendation, it's when you go to Alaska, take some time to to really get up there, enjoy it, put yourself in the best opportunities to see these uh, to see these wild uh, and beautiful animals. Uh, in this particular one of the trips into Glacier Bay, uh, and they're not always like this, but we saw 20 plus bears on this one trip in, and uh, that wasn't every trip, but it was it was a really a phenomenal thing when you start to realize the uh, the prevalence up there. This particular one, I'm sure this is Lisa's photo, but you know what you see is you'll see them actually walking along the shore, and they'll lift up that rock that's behind uh, uh, it's behind the right leg. They'll lift that up and it will look like it's nothing. I mean, that boulder will be so easy to lift up and you realize the power of these animals. A couple cute little cubs uh, uh, playing as well. And then I, I got this little shot here of this black bear. This was on a kayak trip in Glacier Bay uh, National Park. And backing away from our campsite, um, right as soon as we got just got done packing up all of our stuff and putting everything back into our kayaks, we started to back away and, and, uh, and, and this one had a look at us. Because of course, these guys, and, and you know what these guys are after when they're, when the, these, these beautiful grizzlies, and these, these grizzlies down in Southeast, they're just so big. And they're after the same thing that we're after, and it's this, it's the salmon. They're, they're after the salmon. Um, you know, when these salmon runs start, it's just, it's, it's, it's a feeding frenzy for these bears. And, and not only the bears, for everything else that feeds off of that. You've got the eagles overhead. Uh, you've got the seals and sea lions and other things uh, picking up scraps. You've got all sorts of animals that come in. But I'll never forget the first time I, you know, I caught a salmon. I can, I can truthfully say I caught those three there in the picture or four in the picture there. And that's not a fisherman's tail. I, I did catch those. But um, the first time you start to fillet those and you see that red color, that, that, that fresh, natural red salmon, I mean, it is just, it, it's, it's unlike anything else. Uh, and then similarly on, the, uh, on the, the left side of your screen, you see some of the Dungeness crab there. Now these Dungeness crab, you know, if you drop a crab pot up in, up in Alaska, uh, you know, you'll pull up a crab pot just absolutely packed with these Dungeness crab and it makes a, a, great, a great day. Uh, this was in St. James, uh, I think James, St. James State Park, it looks like. Um, we were at a little cabin out there, a little forest service cabin out there, and, and cooked up these Dungeness crab. And of course, I'd be lying if I said you didn't wash them down with a nice cold Alaskan amber brewing uh, from out uh, based out of Juneau. So one of the things that I, you know, I love with Lindblad is that we have a focus on sustainability and, and local fresh um, uh, foods. And so it's really one thing that tied me to Lindblad. Uh, after my time being in Alaska, I really wanted to be with a company that was serving local foods, serving locally caught fish, um, you know, buying it from the fishermen there. Uh, we have a crab feast uh, on board our ships as well with all locally caught crabs. So there's certain things like that that I think are really important. But yeah, you can find just, just great stuff all around. Probably one of my favorites there, Icy Bay IPA, uh, again, made out of Juneau. So there's a, a really incredible phenomenon um, that, that you see very often or quite often in Alaska and it's, it's bubble net feeding. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing. And, and we've got a partnership with Alaska Whale Foundation um, and, and they, they do a lot of research up there with the, uh, with the whales. And one of the things that they study is the, the bubble net feeding. And they talk about how these, these whales create teams and, 
and will they each have a role and they'll they'll go out and what they're doing in this in this picture. So this picture, you may see a, a small ring there on the water level. And what you're seeing is these whales will actually work together and they'll, they'll get together, they'll work together and they'll go down and they'll, they'll go around a school of herring and they'll go down and they'll, they'll work in a team and blow bubbles. And you're, so you're seeing those bubbles there. And what they'll do is they'll get closer and uh, tighter and tighter. And as, the, as those bubbles start to rise, it brings all the, all the food together. And then they'll come up to the surface and they'll come all the way out of the, out of the surface with their mouths open. And they'll, they'll just get an absolute ton of, of, um, of food in all in one, uh, one serving. And they'll do this over and over and over again as a team. Uh, it's something I've been very fortunate to see quite often, um, uh, which, is, which is really pretty incredible. And it's something that's pretty unique to Alaska uh, uh, as far as the, you know, how often it's seen in that area. Uh, this picture, if you believe it or not, was actually taken, uh, I'm not a professional photographer by any means. I don't have the big fancy lenses, so if you, if you do, you're more than welcome. And uh, this photo was actually taken, I was standing on a dock. Um, uh, this, was a, a, this was a set of two whales that throughout the entire winter had bubble net fed um, for oh, probably a month right through downtown Ketchikan, Alaska. So they were just back and forth. They would just go up and down the coast for a month straight. Uh, and all the locals were talking about it. In fact, it happened again this summer. And it was, uh, excuse me, um, yeah, it was this summer. Uh, it happened again in Ketchikan. And everyone was talking about this, 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 these two humpback whales that were just bubble net feeding. Another shot um, that was taken, same place actually, right on the dock. Yeah, this is right in uh, downtown Ketchikan. Um, these killer whales were coming through town one day and I, I actually saw them from my house. I, I ran down to the dock to go get a better look and, and was fortunate enough to see one spy hopping here. And you can see it's sort of, sort of sunset there, which, you know, that's another pretty unique thing. I mean, sunset, people don't realize it when they get ready to, to go to Alaska. But, um, you know, as you get further north, you, you really start to get these really long days. Um, so this, you know, I, I don't know for a fact what time this picture was taken, but it was probably sometime around 10 o'clock, maybe 11 o'clock at night during the summertime. Um, so it was a pretty, pretty late picture. You can still see that sun was setting, but that also gives you really long, beautiful sunsets and, and just some really great colors. So uh, photographers love it up there. There's never a shortage of things to, to, to photograph. But I lived, uh, this is again, Ketchikan. I lived in Ketchikan for nine years. Um, uh, year round, was fortunate to, to spend my time there. It's a, it's a place I absolutely love. And, and Southeast Alaska, if there's, if there's one thing I can, I can you know, tell you, it's, it's just when you get out and you spend time exploring these areas, you realize that there's a million little bays, a million little inlets, and they're all, you know, you might think they're all the same, but you start to get up into them and and, and you might find a giant waterfall at the end that you can nose the boat up into. Um, you might find a, a rookery at the end of another. And so there's this sort of sense of, of curiosity that has always kept me exploring Alaska. It's, it's the reason I, I go up every year, even, even now. And, and it's um, the reason I will continue to, because it's just such a, I don't know, it's such a neat place that you can really, really, uh, you never know what you're gonna see next. And there's, there's so many great opportunities to see things. Here's another photo of a, of a killer whale that was taken outside of Juneau. Uh, and then of course, what people are always looking for, the, the, the breaching as well. You know, and I, I don't wanna to spend too much time focusing about the, the big things that people tend to go to see because there's also all the little things. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's these sea otters that you see around you and, and I, I, I don't care who you are. There's no way that sea otter is not the cutest little animal in the world when you see it on, see it on its back. And uh, especially if you can see it with a, with a baby otter there as well and, and eating. Um, but these are really a, a really neat story here of how these were nearly hunted to extinction um, and have really done a great job of, of, of recovering and, uh, you know, and are, are back in really sustainable numbers, which is great. There's also, uh, you know, you've got sea lions, you've got seals laying out on the ice. Uh, these guys are all around. And again, when you get down into water level and you get down into a kayak and you take the time to really get down and get these sort of shots where you're High level with them, where you're there with a you know a pup there. I mean, there's really just some spectacular things to see, um, and it's again sort of all around you. Of course, you've got other other animals you can see, other things to see. 
community, and, and we see quite a few of these guys there in Glacier Bay National Park. Um, if there's one spot I, I really like to talk about, it's Glacier Bay National Park. And part of it is just because of the wildlife around it. Part of it's, again, just such a, it's, it's such a large space and you really see these giant glaciers, but you also start to learn about, you know, what, how, how much these glaciers have receded, uh, how much things have changed uh, in, in, in Alaska uh, and, and the world for that matter, as far as the glaciers. So it's a really a great opportunity to, to give you a scale of these glaciers. And, and most people haven't had the opportunity to see a glacier um, and, and don't really understand that, that scale. So I always think it's great to get out again, explore, um, if you're, if you're fortunate enough to see some of the some of the calving, which which almost everyone is, uh, you know, which is almost a, a good thing and a bad thing. You know, you're watching a, you're watching this just this ice that has been around for so 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 long um, at this point, you know, and uh, falling off into the into the water. But again, when it comes to scale and spectrum, I mean, you're talking about you'll watch a piece of ice fall off and it'll seem like a pebble, but you you know, then your, your guide will tell you. Hey, that thing was actually probably about 10 stories tall, or that thing was probably the size of a, of a large house. And you start to really start to understand how small you are uh, in, in this world, uh, excuse me, in this, uh, you know, in this, this environment here. And then of course, there's the colors. I mean, the beautiful blues, the, uh, the hues, the way as the, as the clouds come in and the clouds go out. And if there's one thing that is a given in Alaska, it's gonna be clouds. Uh, I mean, it is the weather, where I lived in Ketchikan, Alaska, they, they averaged, on average, got 13 feet of rain a year. So uh, one thing's for sure, there's probably gonna be some rain. Um, but if there's one thing I learned while living there, it's that you start to enjoy the beauty of, of that. You start to realize that that's what causes that mist that sort of crawls up the, uh, the side of the mountainside. That's what creates a lot of these different colors of blues and the hues and everything. So. Uh, it's what gives life up there, but it's also, uh, at times, it can be a lot, 13 feet of rain, so. Um, again, another another photo of just sort of exploring the, uh, the ice and, and really getting out and starting to see that. Um, there's also, you know, a significant amount of, of Native culture uh, in the area. I always find that interesting because, you know, there's, there's obviously a lot of history, um, you know, throughout the world with Native cultures and such, and Alaska is a an interesting place because it's, you, you know, where I lived in Ketchikan, you have, you know, Ketchikan, uh, which has, you know, just a, all sorts of deep history. And then Saxman Native Village is a, is a living, working Native village um, uh, that's, that's just south of, of Ketchikan. And the, the interaction between the two is really interesting to, to, to be a part of. Um, I would say that the town of Ketchikan really celebrates the Native culture and, and really um, you know, a lot of events are held. In fact, the, the monthly um, uh, arts festivals and such, uh, the monthly grind, those are all held down at the Saxman, the tribal house. And there's, there's just a lot of really neat interaction that goes on there. Um, and then throughout Alaska, you know, you, you, you've got uh, these, these incredible uh, native groups that are just so willing to show you their culture and to explore their culture and to share their songs and dance and, and, and their experiences and their way of life. It's, it's pretty neat to be able to see uh, and, and also to see sort of modernization and, and also how these cultures work together with, um, with the modern, um, you know, some of the modern towns uh, that, they're, that they're associated with. So it's really interesting to see. Um, this here, these photos here on the left, this is a, a totem pole in um, Sitka, Alaska. So it's just off the Sitka historical uh, totem park there, uh, just off of town. And then on the right hand side is the, um, Longhouse out of uh, Glacier Bay, so it's in Bartlett Cove in Glacier Bay National Park. So you just really get an opportunity to, to see these different cultures um, and explore it. And then the only last thing you know to, to share with you as well is one thing that I that I, I really learned about a lot was some of the undersea. Um, so we we often take advantage our granted for the, these giant vistas up above us, uh, this wildlife that we're seeing, um, this cultural side that we're seeing. But there's so much underneath uh, underneath the sea that we can see um, uh, from from you know octopus to enemies. And one thing that's pretty unique about about Limblad is we'll get down. We actually have divers on board that'll go down and we'll do diving, and we'll come back up with their footage and show the footage uh, throughout, explain uh, what they saw in the dives. Uh, if you ask me, it's probably the best job in the world. They get they get paid to dive in these incredible locations and 
and see some incredible things. And, uh, and, and for us, we don't have to get cold. We get to stay up top and, and just enjoy uh, seeing that afterwards. So again, I think there's some really spectacular things to see there and, and some great um, underseas. And then, you know, the, the only, I, I would say the, the last thing to, I guess just to highlight is, is these, these, these wild vistas. You know, when you can get out, in particular, get out on a ship. And this is why I say take the time because you get out in these areas and there's not another, another vessel, another small boat, another fishing boat. There's nothing in this photo. I mean, it's just, it's just you and, and the mountains. And, and, and I'm sure at some point a, a whale came up somewhere in this photo shortly after it was taken. And you just have this, this really moments to sort of reflect. And similarly, you know, this was a, a photo I took outside of, um, this is outside of the town of Puna. We had anchored up um, in, in a bay that night. And we were the only ones. There was, there was really no one else out there. It's just, just you and, and these, these spectacular um, scenes and these spectacular sights to see. So, you know, it really is something great. Um, it's a place that I could, I could talk about all day. Um, I really could. I, it's, it's, it's an area that has captured me. And I, I share the story because I think it's really important um, how much it transformed me and how much of a role it's played in the last 15 years of my life and how much of a role it will play in the next 15 years of my life. So um, I really encourage anyone to get up and see it. This year is, is like no other year. Um, you know, I was just actually looking at the numbers the other day and uh, even a, a place like Denali National Park, uh, I believe they had 650,000 visitors in 2019 and they had under 60,000 in 2020. And so you can see these numbers and, and that's an area that's even harder to get to. And so you can see these numbers um, are really, really low and, and um, you know, and, and the Alaskan folks really need it. A lot of my friends uh, and, and, and colleagues up there, you know, they really need to, to have tourism come back up, they rely on tourism. And so it's, a, it's a, in a, a sad year in that regard, but it's also a great opportunity for folks to get up to Alaska, to really enjoy it, to see it in a way that, that will never be seen again. Oh, and Craig, we can't even let you yeah. off there because lots of questions are coming in. Wondering if you could talk a little bit, you just finished look, talking a little bit about the native peoples of Alaska. And uh, we have some folks that are interested specifically in the Inuit. Are they in Alaska? Are they in certain parts? Is there certain parts to go see more of a native experience than others? You know, Inuit, I'm, I'm actually not terribly familiar with Inuit because I believe the Inuit tri um, uh, group is actually up in interior Alaska. In Southeast Alaska, there's three, uh, three main groups, uh, and that's the Shimshian, the Clinket, and the Haida. And they all sort of have different areas that, that they tend to, um, uh, to reside in uh, of that area. And actually some places have, have where they overlap. Um, but you can tell some differences as well. Often when you look at the totem poles, you can tell differences by the colors uh, of the totem poles that are used. And the, the, the reason for that is they use a lot of the different uh, materials for the areas that they lived in is what they used to dye the to dye the paint, uh, which is made of actually fish eggs, is what they use for the for the paint for those uh, for those totem poles. And then we have lots of questions coming in about time of year, so I'm going to roll a couple of them in because people are really curious about northern lights, probably at the end of a typical season, but also things like the salmon run. Could you let us know? You know, if we were starting in May, so to speak, and running through the summer, what's the typical expectation? between months or between like a couple of months movement? Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a great question. It's probably one of the most common questions. Um, I'll tell you, it's, it's, there's, the, let me start by saying there's, there's, there's no bad time to be in Alaska. They're very, very different. Uh, again, I, I lived there year round for nine years. Um, uh, well, okay, there's a bad time. Maybe October when it's raining, you know, you're getting a foot of rain, that might be a bad time. But, uh, but in general, there's never a bad time to be in Alaska. You know, when you start at the beginning of the year, you'll start to get a lot of the cubs. You start to see a lot of the, um, uh, there tends to be a lot of the, a lot of the whales coming up. They're, they're definitely there in May, but April and May, they're really coming up. And so you start to see whale populations build. You start to see a lot of the cubs coming out, um, bear cubs, things like that. June tends to be one of the drier months um, of the year. Um, but again, wildlife still all around. Into July is when you really start to get the salmon runs. Um, and I have to say when the salmon runs start, it, it really, everything kind of gets kicked into overdrive. Uh, you have the bears uh, all down at the, at the creeks. Uh, you have all the eagles, of course. You have everything that goes along with that. 
um, coming in. And there's multiple runs. There's five different species of salmon. So there's going to be different runs at different times in different parts of Alaska. Um, but they'll run all the way through July, August, into September. And there's actually even some runs into October, some of the coho runs into October. Um, as for Northern Lights, you know, the, the, the challenge, of course, is Northern Lights, you need two things, right? You need, well, you need three things, but you need, you need clear skies to see them. And, and of course, as I just mentioned with the rain, you know, that's, that's a hard thing to get. You also have to have them going, of course, which is pretty popular, but you also need darkness. And a lot of times in the summer, uh, you know, in your, if you're talking about June, July, August, and those months, you know, the, the, the length of day, it's not, it's only getting dark for an hour or two some of those nights, uh, maybe three hours sometimes. So um, pretty limited to see them, but we definitely see them. Uh, and we see them in particular when in, in later August and into September is when you see them in Southeast Alaska in the interior, it starts a little bit earlier, of course, because you're further north. No, that's amazing. Um, it, it, can you chat a bit about birds? I mean, I know you've mentioned eagles a couple of times, but do you have any favorite birds or things that people have to keep their eye out? Oh, see now birds, I always get, I always get this question and I have to admit I'm one of the worst. I, I, birds are, I'm just, I, I, we, we have a company that is full of people, uh, full of birders. And we have like one guy who's not a birder and you're, I'm on the call. And we're talking to him. <laughs> I have to tell you, Angela, but that said, I really do. I mean, honestly, the bald eagles alone, I mean, bald eagles, it's one of those things where you could sit and you could watch, you could, you can sit at any given place in Alaska and you can point out bald eagles like this. I mean, yeah. you truthfully can. There are so many, uh, I've seen 50 bald eagles in one tree. Um, no exaggeration, 50 bald eagles in one tree. So, you know, the amount of, of birds that are up there is really spectacular. You do get puffins up in Alaska, um, up in, in Glacier Bay. Um, so there's a place when you come into Glacier Bay National Park, um, um, the Marble Island, which has a lot of great puffins there. Uh, folks get a chance to see and get really excited to see. Um, and a lot of other migratory birds. We, we do have some trips um, that actually go up uh, into, kind of up into the Aleutian chain uh, and up through that area. And there you've got some, some great bird migrations that go on. Um, fortunately, they're overseen by someone that knows a lot more about birds than I do, so. <laughs> no, but I think that's a really important point. You know, as people choose how they travel to Alaska, one of the things to remember is that when you go with different companies, Lindblad being one of them, there are experts on very specific things on the ships, and they're accessible to anyone like myself who is like, that's a nice bird, <laughs> and they tell me lots of interesting things. But at the same time, you know, there are experts in each area and photography, I think, is one that I'd love you guys to highlight. You know, I'm there with my iPhone and my little camera and my husband has rented this huge thing because he's convinced he'll get the National Geographic photo of the year. Tell us a little more about photography. How does that work up in Alaska? Yeah, it's it, it's it's a perfect uh, a perfect thing up there. It's so I mean, Alaska is set up for photography. It really is. You've got these. You've got everything from vistas to wildlife to the the, the micro photography to the small shots. So uh, we do have a certified uh, a photographic instructor, National Geographic certified photo instructor on board all the ships. So you know, when you want to learn about photography, that person is there. They're always on deck, walking around, teaching, uh, giving tips uh, as you're trying to deal with the moody light that I was talking about earlier, and you're trying to deal with the clouds and how to. They're usually probably telling you to keep your camera dry, things like that. But, yep. you know, really um, talking to you about a lot of that stuff. That said, they also, you know, for you, Angela, they, they also uh, do a presentation about iPhone photography because, I mean, let's be honest, so many of us travel around with our iPhones and, and really we, we don't know how to use them uh, with, when you look at all the features that we have. Yeah. Um, so we do it. It's one of our, actually, our more pro popular photography lectures is a lecture about iPhone photography. It's about taking time lapses and, and all the little features and, um, that, that most of us don't know how to use. Um, so that's really, really popular as well. Um, but yeah, always great opportunities to get out and, and photograph. We, uh, uh, every one of the field staff members you'll usually see carrying around a big camera as well because you know, they love to get that shot as well. And they'll be, they'll be next to the guests, you know, teaching them what they're doing so you get a chance to, to really interact. And we have um, we have our BNH photo locker on all of the ships up in Alaska. So we have an, an agreement with BNH photos out of New York, and so they provide us with state of the art equipment 
And that is in this great locker on the ship and you can go each evening and the expedition leader will allow you to check out a piece so you can try it in the field. So it's a great way if you're thinking about getting a new mirrorless camera or you want to try one of those really cool um, professional lenses, you can check it out for a day and give it a whirl. It's, it's really fun. See, now you know your significant other doesn't need to buy a new one before you go, just saying. <laughs> but I do have a question about intimacy. You know, people look at Alaska and, and yeah, there's a lot of options out there. And so tell us a little bit more about getting right in. Like some of your photos are amazing. Does, does that happen on these expeditions? How do you make that happen? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it's, so we, I mean, it, some people think it's easy. It's not. I'll tell you, we have a we have a team of staff on board uh, that are that are traveling with you. These field staff that are traveling with you, and they're constantly scanning for the best opportunity. So they're constantly scanning for wildlife. The captains and the first officers are up on the bridge, constantly looking for wildlife and things. And one of the, the great things about what we do, uh, and it's what brought me to Limblad, is there is no itinerary. So if if we come across some whales and we want to spend an hour or two or three watching those whales bubble net feed, we will. We don't have anywhere to be. We're, we're going to go where the best thing is. And, and on that first day or second day, if you see whales that are bubble net feeding and a bunch of the guests, you know, of course, everyone next wants to see a bear. We won't spend the second, third, fourth, fifth days looking for whales bubble net feeding. We've seen that there. We come across it, we'll watch it again, but we're going to go look for other stuff. And so we really spend the time trying to get into the best spots. Um, Every expedition leader sends in a sort of a, a theoretical a plan A of what they think they want to do for the week and where they think they want to go. And if any one of those expedition leaders makes it uh, through the week before getting the plan, you know, G, I'd be surprised because it's constantly changing. They're they're going where the weather is. They're going where um, with what the guests want to see, with particular interests and, and what people want to see. Um, that's a, that the other big advantage is our ships are our ships were intentionally built for design for seeing these areas. So these ships have anywhere from an eight and a half to a ten and a half foot draft. So they can pull right up into a lot of these little bays. They can you know put their nose right up against a, a waterfall and and let you get wet on the front on the bow of the ship. They can really get into these small spots. And, and that's a huge advantage. It really lets you go into that cove to anchor up like that last photo I showed everyone and, and really get a chance to, to feel like you're, 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 you're tucked up and, and nice and cozy for the night. Um, and, I, and Angela, I can kind of expand on that a little bit. So that grizzly shot that um, Craig showed, I shot from up in Alaska, that bear had come down out of the woods. Um, one of our spotters, Carlos Navarro, who has the most eagle eyes for spotting grizzly. I've never known someone who can spot them from miles away when he looks when it looked like a rock when we first saw it. And the boat was able to come along shore and Captain Cook was able to just quietly move the boat facing into the to the coast, along the coast. And we tracked that bear for an hour. And, and the ship is built so that you have two viewing platforms out on the bow and then you can go up onto the bridge where there's another viewing platform. So everyone has this brilliant line of sight for photography. And we tracked him until he, he went for a swim, he dug for clams, as Craig said, they pick up boulders and it's like, eh. Um, and then they moved up the coast and then he finally got to another area and went inland. But we spent a good hour. And what was amazing was there's a there's 100 people on these on our boat so it's really intimate and small scale but it was silent I, the only thing you heard was cameras clicking and just oh, people sucking in their breath as he'd kind of turn and someone would get this great shot of him kind of looking at them um and so that's as craig said we're on we're on the wildlife schedule we're not on anyone else's schedule and the other thing that was really uh, unique when i was up there last year is Everyone does go for these big things like the bear and the, 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 the really big known wildlife. But when you get down on your hands and feet, there's all these little carnivorous plants in Alaska. Um, there's hundreds of little orchids and they're, they're this big. And so you get down into the grass with one of our folks and just the flora, um, someone mentioned it there that the flora there is stunning. I mean, you walk through the forest around Lake Eva and there's, and I'm going to forget the name of the plant, but it looks like a big cab cabbage leaf or a, and it, the, it looks like you're, you're, you feel like you're tiny because these plants are about three feet tall and it, it looks like you should be this tiny little thing wandering around. But it, it's just, 
it, it blows your mind. And it, it's one of those places that you do, you feel so small because it is just so remarkably beautiful and big. And so on that intimate question and just on that quiet as mice, I have children. I have a nine-year-old. <laughs> is, is Alaska a terrible place to bring kids? Is it a good idea? You know, tell us a little bit about multi-generations. I know we're always interested. So, you know, you have, you have kids who may be graduating high school or you have kids who are making um, a big step or people haven't seen each other in many, 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 many months. And I know we're all experiencing the same thing. I, you know, What's the experience like? What's a good age, good time? Tell so us. We, we have our Global Explorers program on board our ship. So, and, and Craig can probably talk to a little bit more of the experiences when they're up there. But so um, about four years ago, we worked with National Geographic Education and we put together what's called our Global Explorers program. And that is really designed to engender in our young guests under 18, this feeling of exploration and, and wanting the desire to get out there to learn about what they're seeing and to provide them the opportunities to do that. And so that's on every Alaska departure, we have a certified field instructor and their job is when those younger guests get on board and we do have a lot of multi-generational families travel with us and families, they bring those, those younger guests together they get this amazing field notebook, which has places for them to journal, to do illustrations. There's research that they'll do in the field. They'll take water samples. They'll learn to drive a Zodiac. They'll go out and they'll have uh, lists of animals they need to spot during the day. And then they come back and share that. And so it's really an opportunity for them to be fully engaged. Like one of the things we always laugh about when we're on the ships is all the teenagers and the kids turn up with these things and they're all like, oh, yeah, okay, mom, whatever. Yep, 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 we're first briefing. By day two, the only reason these come out is for photos. They, they totally disengage from their technology, which is a blessing in itself, right? But they, they are so a part of the experience. Um, so look, we, you know, I think five and up is a great age for Alaska. I think, you know, we've had, we have younger, we don't have childcare on our ships though, but usually that's for those families who've been traveling with their children since they were babies in a backpack. So, but it is, it is such a remarkable place for younger guests to explore because there's hiking, we paddleboard, we kayak, we're in the zodiacs. A lot of the wildlife is up close. You know, you've got otters around you. You've, um, yeah, it's it's just a stunning place for families. No, that's really good to know. That's great, uh, Craig. We're going to turn it over to you. We have really interesting questions. More about you know, from the time that you lived in. Um, Alaska and the time now you're living outside of Seattle. Um, do you have friends who chat a bit, you know, major political issues or issues that are happening there around race or integration with the native cultures that, you know, you can particularly learn about when you travel to Alaska? Is that apparent? Is that something people can seek out? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we always try to, on, on all our trips, always try to have someone that is a, um, uh, that, that focuses on native culture. And so, you know, we won't shy away from conversations around, um, around some of the challenges in, in native, in, in, in native um, culture as well in Alaska. And there is, there's a lot of, Alaska as a whole has a lot of factors. There's, there's logging, there's, uh, there's obviously, you know, the conservation side, which is, I, I would say Lindblad, which is more of, you know, protecting areas. Uh, there's mining, which is also another relatively controversial topic when you talk about salmon runs and the salmon fisheries and all of that's on native land. And so there are a lot of, um, of politics that go on, especially as it comes to these other, um, to these large mines and to some of these other um, um, larger uh, projects that are ongoing. So yeah, I think if you wanted to go up and learn about that, it is, it is all around you. And, uh, and I certainly feel like um, anyone up there would be willing. One thing about Alaskans, they will certainly tell you their opinion. Uh, so, uh, so I think uh, there would be no shortage of conversation around that, which is truthfully really helpful to have conversations around. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think we could keep going all night long. So I'm going to quickly forward some of the slides here, though, and certainly thank everybody who's been here to chat with us. Um, Craig, we have a couple. Oh, look at these pictures. I'm just going to pause here for a minute. I know a lot of people have a ton more questions. We at the Mark Twain Library hope you read as much as you would like. Um, I know on my behalf, I have access to some absolutely fantastic resources, whether you want 
a reminder of the good time of year to travel, whether you want reminders of different activities, especially for families, or if you're getting together for a romantic getaway, this is an ideal place. This for me is my romantic getaway. So maybe that tells you a little something uh, about who I am. But uh, certainly you can always reach out. I'd be more than happy to connect you as well with these amazing experts from Lindblad. And we certainly thank them for their time. I know everyone here was really engaged. And I will just say that uh, certainly on behalf of the Mark Twain Library, we hope that you continue traveling in your mind at home through books and eventually in person. Um, I'll ask you to just advance one more time because we have other things that will be coming up uh, certainly around the world. And we hope that you stay tuned to the emails or certainly the websites um, and see more about what's coming up in the future. But I have a very sincere thank you to Craig and Lisa for joining us tonight. Your time is invaluable. And uh, what I've learned tonight is truly going to inspire dreaming. My big dreams tonight will happen at home and I certainly hope to learn more. What we might do, if it's okay with everyone, if we're going to say thank you, but I do have a spare treat in the next few minutes. I know that Lisa has a very special video. So if you wanna hang on for a few more minutes, we wanna show you something that is truly unique and something that I have recently learned about in Alaska, which is a great experience. Lisa, do you wanna cue it up? Yeah, can you see the um, anemone there right now? Let me see. It's beginning. Awesome. Yep, okay. So this is just, um, we have an amazing underwater program on all of our ships. We have divers in the water that are sharing what is beneath our ships because when you're on a ship 50 percent of the experience is beneath you so this is this is quiet so it's a moment of zen so this was shared by carlos navarro one of our great great expedition leaders um, and i just wanted to share some of this brilliant footage he shot when i was with him up in alaska so enjoy
Wow. Thank you, Lisa and Craig. That was amazing. Um, At Mark Twain Library, that just made my night in so many amazing ways. I cannot wait to go explore. We have wows and wows coming in across the board. So a tremendous thank you to both of you. And thank you to everyone for listening and for your support of Mark Twain Library. Again, we will be delighted to share the recording of this fabulous uh, hour with you on YouTube. So look for that in the next few days. But of course, reach out to us. Let us know if there's anything else we can do to help. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Craig, on behalf of all of us on the East Coast, stay happy, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you in Alaska. Great. Thank you so much. Can't wait. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.